the invitation. Um, you might wonder why uh, uh, a lecture on uh, British anti-slavery fits into a conference on Reformation 500. Um, but I guess I'm going to argue that this, uh, that British anti-slavery is in some ways an episode uh, in the history of Protestantism. Uh, and that it illuminates uh, an era when Protestants thought that they could take over the world, transform the world, uh, that this was indeed their destiny. Um, and this uh, was one of the most optimistic eras in Protestant history, particularly in the history of uh, British evangelicals. Uh, and that optimism uh, was fostered, obviously, by a, a revitalization of British Protestantism by a dramatic surge in overseas missions, particularly in the first half of the 19th century, uh, by Britain's industrial growth and imperial expansion. But it was also underpinned by uh, an eschatology, by a particular reading of biblical prophecy. So I'm going to argue that that was actually of some importance to uh, the anti-slavery movement. So why did British abolitionists come to believe that the eradication of slavery was possible or even necessary? After all, slavery was not only an integral part of the imperial economy, it was also an ancient social institution, sanctioned by classical civilization and the Bible itself. It continued to thrive in the 19th century, showing every sign of adapting to modernity. Part of the answer lies in the Enlightenment belief in human progress. But as David Brian Davis has noted, religion was the primary concern of all the British abolitionist leaders from Granville Sharp to Thomas Fowle Buxton. And in the minds of most abolitionists, progress was underwritten by providence. Indeed, I want to argue that the missionary millennialism of English-speaking Protestantism was a vital stimulus to abolitionist ambition. Now, this is not an entirely novel idea. In American historiography, uh, it's a truism that abolitionists shared the millenarian fervor of the Second Great Awakening. But apart from a brief encyclopedia article, there has been remarkably little analysis of the role of eschatology in American abolitionist thought. Scholars of British anti-slavery have paid even less attention to the subject. Duncan Rice stated that post-millennial assumptions were essential to all the activities of the benevolent empire on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and Boyd Hilton and Alex Tyrrell uh, respectively have emphasized the importance of post-millennialism to evangelical Anglicans and the moral radical party of Joseph Sturge, respectively. And uh, most notably, David Brian Davis has argued that evangelical and Quaker abolitionists attempted to fuse two conceptions of change, the gradualism of enlightenment progress, the idea of chronos, and the idea of a kairos moment, of an eschatological leap. Yet, as in the American case, these suggestive observations have not led to a systematic treatment of abolitionist millennialism. So what I want to do in this paper is, first of all, to kind of sketch the emergence of millennialism within Protestant eschatology in the 17th century and its mainstreaming in the 18th. Then I want to look at a couple of objections to the thesis that millennialism has much to do or it does much for anti-slavery. Uh, but then I want to go on to look at the convergence of millennialism and anti-slavery, uh, focused particularly on the Anglican leadership of the British abolitionist movement, people like Granville Sharp and Clarkson and Wilberforce. And then finally, the, the, the road to emancipation after 1807, after the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. So first of all, the rise of Protestant millennialism. In classic Christian thought, slavery was a consequence of the fall. It was not part of the original created order, uh, and Aristotle in that sense was wrong to claim that some men are by nature slaves. Slavery would be no part of the new creation, but it was a fact of life in the interim, in the fallen world. For Augustine in that sense it was analogous to war, not something to be celebrated as a gift of the creator, but a necessary evil, a punishment for humanity's sin, an instrument for order, an institution and practice that could be regulated and ameliorated, but not eradicated. In the Justinian Code, slavery was a single institution, contrary to the law of nature, but sanctioned by the law of nations, or international law. Moreover, there was no reason to think that slavery would be abolished as human history reached its climax. Augustine made a powerful case against millenarians who expected a thousand-year reign of 
the saints upon the earth at the end of history. The millennium, he argued, should be interpreted figuratively to refer to the period from the first coming of Christ to the end of the world. During this era, the church age, Satan was restrained and the church was free to preach the gospel. But it was illusory to expect an imminent age of earthly bliss. This amillennialism, as it's technically called, meshed with the anti-perfectionism of the later Augustine and enabled Christians to come to terms with the disappointing reality of Christendom and the persistence of war and slavery in a Christian society. Augustine's rejection of the idea of a future millennium would become medieval orthodoxy, and it was firmly endorsed by the magisterial reformers who revered the Latin father. The Protestant confessions dismissed the fable of the millennium and dreams of a golden age on earth prior to the final judgment. Yet the reformers did innovate by developing a historicist anti-papal reading of the apocalyptic books, as Peter Matheson was reminding us earlier today. Reading with hindsight, they came to believe that these texts predicted the rise of the papacy from the late 4th century through the Middle Ages. It was the fourth monarchy of Daniel and the whore of Babylon in the book of Revelation. However, this historicist hermeneutic, this way of reading the book of Revelation, created a severe historiographical problem. Unlike Augustine, 16th century reformers usually taught that the millennium was a literal period in the church's past. Uh, perhaps the first thousand years of Christianity or a thousand years from when Constantine had become the protector of the church. But at the same time, they were claiming that this period had also seen the rise of papal antichrist. So there seemed to be this uh, jarring between claiming that there was a past millennium, but this was also the era in which antichrist had arisen. And in the early 17th century, a number of leading Protestant divines resolved the contradiction by concluding that the millennium had either begun with the forerunners of the Reformation in the late Middle Ages or was soon to follow in its wake. So the idea of a future millennium emerges among Protestant theologians in the early 17th century. This expectation was promoted by English theologians like Thomas Brightman and Joseph Mead and by European Calvinists like Johannes Piscator and Johann Heinrich Alsted. And as Richard Muller remarks, it involved a vast revision of reformed eschatology. The other thing that happens around this time is you get the development of what's been called a Judeocentric hermeneutic, or way of reading the Old Testament, so that the prophecies that refer to Zion or to Israel are now seen not as referring figuratively to the church, but as referring literally to the Jews and to Jerusalem. So whole swathes of Old Testament prophecy are now prophecies of a coming millennium. So it leads to a kind of ra radically different way of reading whole parts of the Old Testament. Now, historians were once inclined to depict millennialism as a creed for cranks, but modern scholarship has shown that it was a creed for the intelligentsia, adopted and promoted by major Protestant thinkers like Comenius, Hartlib, John Milton, and John Owen. Whereas it was once common to assume that apocalyptic speculation was a Puritan preoccupation, eclipsed by the restoration of the monarchy and episcopacy, we now recognise that it persisted among Anglicans and dissenters. Uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, if you ever read any of his books, likes to play jokes in his index entries. Uh, and in the Reformation uh, and Social Change, he has an index entry for Antichrist, uh, in which he says, you know, Antichrist due to fall 1639, question mark, perhaps, you know, 1655, um, expires 1660. Uh, so this idea that an interest in Antichrist and apocalyptic dies down with you know, the Merry Monarch uh, was once well established. But it's quite clear now that um, apocalyptic thought continued to flourish within the Church of England and among mainstream dissent long after that. And during the England's Protestant Enlightenment, uh, being re-articulated by Anglican divines like Henry Moore, Gilbert Burnett, Daniel Whitby, and Thomas Newton, and by dissenters such as Moses Lohman. Crucially, proponents of this scholarly brand of millennialism often distance themselves from the more outlandish and catastrophic styles of eschatology. Uh, and this is particularly true of um, Daniel Whitby uh, in his Treatise of the Millennium in 1703. He emphasised the respectability of the judicious 
millenarians of modern times, as he called them. Unlike early Christian Kiliasts and modern sectaries, they did not adopt a crassly literalist reading of biblical prophecy. The first resurrection of the saints in the book of Revelation was not a physical resuscitation of dead Christian martyrs, it was a metaphor for the spiritual revival of the church in the latter days. There would be no personal reign of Christ from Jerusalem, uh, Christ being in physically enthroned in Jerusalem, that wouldn't happen. Um, Christ's second coming uh, would be delayed until after the millennial age. So technically this is what's known as post-millennialism. The idea that the uh, second coming happens after the millennium. And that has a very important consequence of uh, the millennium being something into which the church age morphs. So the church age is going to kind of culminate, climax, in the spread and the triumph of the kingdom of God throughout the earth. It won't be inaugurated by the parousia or the second coming of Christ. So although it would be due to the working of divine providence, it would not necessarily be overtly miraculous. So here we have a kind of progressive gradualist idea of, of the triumph of Christianity uh, leading into a millennial age. And this post-millennialism uh, was well suited to the progressive temper of 18th century English Protestantism and soon became mainstream among both churchmen and dissenters. Sober Protestant religion was destined to prevail and as it did so, the false religion of popery would fall, the Jews would convert and the heathen nations would be won to Christ. And with the spread of Christ's kingdom, the human condition would also be improved and transformed. According to Moses Lohman, the millennium was the peaceful and prosperous time foretold by the Jewish prophets, when war would cease and the church would enjoy a happy state. So expectations of a coming millennium can underwrite the Enlightenment's commitment to human betterment in the here and now, which both Jonathan Israel and John Robertson have seen as critical and central to an Enlightenment project, if you can talk in those terms. Providence was promoting progress. At the same time, millennialism was being yoked to evangelical revivalism. The new evangelicals from the 1730s onwards were often critical of the Enlightenment clergy, but on eschatology there was much common ground. Both the dissenter Philip Doddridge and the New Englander Jonathan Edwards lent heavily on Moses Lohman's paraphrase and notes on Revelation. Like other Protestant millenarians, the revivalists combined the historicist reading of Revelation with belief in a future millennium. They were, if you like, historicist post-millennialists. Now, the decades of the uh, British uh, anti-slavery movement, in which it flourished from the 1780s through to the 1830s, were the heyday really of this historicist post-millennialism. In the second half of the 19th century, biblical interpreters would abandon the historicist reading of Revelation. And among evangelicals, particularly the more conservative or fundamentalist evangelicals, uh, a pessimistic premillennialism would overtake post-millennialism as the dominant eschatology. So with the rise of Darwinism and biblical criticism, with the various problems with uh, evangelizing urban Britain and so on, uh, a lot of conservative evangelicals have become more pessimistic about the state of affairs and come to the conclusion that the world was not actually getting better and better, but perhaps getting worse and worse, and only the second coming of Christ would inaugurate the millennium. So that's the pre-millennial view that becomes dominant. But in this period we're looking at post-millennialism uh, still has sort of hegemony. The belief that the church would expand until Christ's kingdom conquered the world flourished across a, bride, uh, a wide spectrum of British Protestantism. It prevailed among evangelicals in the Kirk and among Anglican evangelicals at least uh, until the 1820s, among Baptists and Congregationalists, Methodist, rational dissenters, and even Quakers, who anticipated the consummation of Christ's peaceable kingdom throughout the earth. Post-millennialism was practically a Protestant orthodoxy. Okay, well, if we accept this is so, and you might want to kind of question or nuance that, we can have a discussion about that later. If that's so, does it make any difference uh, to the story we tell about abolitionism? Well, there are two reasons we might think that it, um, it was not a significant factor. So I'll deal with these 
raises a couple of objections. The first is that there's no necessary connection between Protestant millennialism and anti-slavery. So the philosopher John Locke, who was of course a devout, if heterodox, Protestant, anticipated the conversion of the Jews and the worldwide triumph of the gospel, but he saw slavery as a providential vehicle for the Christianization of Africans. The same was true of the Anglican Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, the SPG, founded in 1701. It had its own slave plantation, of course, uh, and while its spokesmen shared millennial hopes, they argued for amelioration of slavery, not abolition. The first generation of evangelical revivalists were not abolitionists either. Jonathan Edwards wrote that the millennium would see the eradication of political as well as spiritual slavery. So in other words, he saw the millennium as, as having a, a political dimension, not, not just a uh, religious one. But he failed to mention uh, the end of black chattel slavery. Uh, and he himself, we know, had at least bought one black slave auction. So David Brian Davis is quite right to observe that the main thrust of 18th century revivalism ended with the missionary, not the abolitionist. For their part, missionaries were keen to work with slaveholders, encouraging them to exercise a paternalist concern for the spiritual welfare of their slaves. Even at the climax of anti-slavery uh, agitation in the early 1830s, the SPG continued to defend Caribbean slavery from abolitionists. It was possible to argue that by allowing Africans to be evangelized, Christian slaveholders were preparing the way for the reign of Christ. And we know that in the antebellum South, the American South, some divines even began to develop what's been called a pro-slavery millennialism, arguing that slavery was a benign institution that would even persist into the millennium itself. Even when post-millennialists had a principled objection to slavery, their eschatology could undermine a sense of urgency. Uh, sociologists of apocalypticism have distinguished between hot millennialists and cool millennialists. Hot millennialists believing that uh, the millennium is imminent, the apocalypse is imminent, cool millennialists thinking it might be you know, centuries off. Um, cool millennialism could be a recipe for gradualism, not immediatism. In the United States, it's been argued that the dominant post-millennial faith encouraged a conciliatory approach to Southern Christians because anti-slavery northerners assumed that slavery would die a slow but natural death as the millennium approached. So there was no need for any real urgency in abolishing it. Providence would do its work in its own time. So if post-millennialists were not necessarily abolitionists, it's also the case that abolitionists often said little about the millennium, or at least about how millennialism and anti-slavery were connected. At its heart, the argument for abolition, whether of the slave trade or slavery, rested on ethical imperatives, eternal principles of justice, humanity, and liberty. When future consequences were considered, the emphasis was on avoiding national punishments, a phrase that was providentialist rather than uh, strictly eschatological. This often functioned as a closing argument in the writings and speeches of abolitionists. They would argue that national sins bring national punishments and that therefore we must abolish the slave trade in order to uh, right Britain's relationship with heaven. But it's rare to find millennialist arguments being used as kind of clincher arguments at the end of speeches or uh, pamphlets. Even when addressing religious arguments to the clergy of Great Britain in 1826, the Anti-Slavery Society made no reference to the millennium. Now, one reason for abolitionist um, reticence was that despite the tradition of scholarly millennialism, talk of biblical prophecies could sound fanatical. The year of the French Revolution saw all kinds of speculation about the book of Revelation, attempts to connect the events of the French Revolution to the vials and trumpets of the book of Revelation, attempts to find Napoleon in, in the apocalypse. Um, and James Gilway knew that he would raise laughter with this cartoon image of the millennium featuring the plebeian prophet Richard Brothers and Pitt the Younger as a horseman of the apocalypse, uh, trampling down his foes and opponents of the French war uh, like Charles James Fox and actually William Wilberforce is a little figure in the striped coat there with the upturned nose who's being a hapless figure he's often portrayed in Gilray cartoons being trampled under the, under the horseman of the apocalypse. So abolitionists were very worried about being charged with enthusiasm one of the most common charges against them that they were uh, religious fanatics uh, so there was a need for them to project a sober image and this is particularly true of the circle around Wilberforce. 
For all their evangelical ardour, the Clapham Circle were self-consciously moderate and polite. Wilberforce's speeches on the slave trade and his two major abolitionist tract make no reference at all to the coming reign of Christ. The scriptural notes of uh, Sir Thomas Fowle Buxton, who's Wilberforce's chosen uh, successor as the leader of uh, the British abolitionist movement in Parliament, reflect, reflect a, a similar cast of mind, moralistic and pietistic, rather than speculative. Uh, Buxton makes notes on the Bible, and he makes notes on the book of Revelation, but it's striking that the passages he lists are all clustered in chapters 1 to 3, the didactic letters to the seven churches. They don't deal with the prophecies of the future that you get in the later chapters. So at first glance, there seems little reason to think that millennialism matters. Its neglect in the existing scholarship accurately reflects its low profile in the sources. But if we should not exaggerate the importance of millennialism and British abolitionism, neither should we understate it. The abolition of the slave trade and then of slavery itself looked like a chimerical scheme, and its advocates needed the precious commodity of hope. Pro-slavery propagandists knew this all too well. They scorned dreams of a future golden age. Slavery had always existed, wrote one, and always will exist, unless all men are reduced to a perfect equality of fortune, unless the Almighty shall please to change the nature of mankind. Abolitionists disagreed, and they did so in part because of their belief in an approaching millennium. Now, the first to forge uh, the connection between prophecy and anti-slavery were the Quaker pioneers of Atlantic abolitionism. Quakers, of course, had originated as an apocalyptic sect, and reformers tapped into this tradition of prophetic discourse. In 1693, George Keith concluded one of the earliest of anti-slavery tracts with the assertion that slaves were the merchandise of Babylon, mentioned in Revelation chapter 18. Quakers must heed the seer's warning, come out of Babylon, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. In his address to all slave keepers in 1737, Benjamin Lay, uh, the Quaker dwarf, who became the first revolutionary abolitionist, according to the latest uh, biography by Marcus Redico, which is just out this week, I think, or this month, um, Lay devote an entire chapter of that tract to the book of Revelation arguing that the buying and selling slaves and souls of men was a fatal compromise with the beast and the whore of Babylon. He also appealed to the optimistic strand in biblical prophecy. Africans were not under the curse of Ham. They were under the promise of the psalmist that Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God from Psalm 68, which becomes the Ethiopian prophecy, as it's often called, becomes one of the uh, key texts, really, of African Uh, American Christianity over the next century. From childhood, John Woolman, a central figure here, uh, had been entranced by Revelation's promise of the healing of the nations, and he looked forward to the peaceful kingdom foreseen by Isaiah. Like Benjamin Lay, he warned Quakers to come out of Babylon by renouncing slavery. As his biographer notes, he sought to point the way forward to a better future, the one foretold in biblical prophecy, and believed that eventually the Quakers would help remake the world. It was a belief shared by Anthony Benizet, the most influential of the Quaker activists. Driving his pacifism and abolitionism was Isaiah's vision of a kingdom of mere love, where all hurt and destroying is done away. By the 1770s, Benizet's um, anti-slavery message was gaining traction with revivalists on both sides of the Atlantic. The crisis of the American Revolution focused minds on the contradiction between libertarian political rhetoric and the brute fact of black slavery. In America, evangelicals inspired by the post-millennialism of Jonathan Edwards now applied it to a cause he had not embraced, anti-slavery. And Jonathan Edwards Jr., his son, writes a tract in which he laments his father's slave owning um, and argues for abolition of the slave trade and slavery itself. Wesley's final letter addressed to Wilberforce would, uh, John Wesley's final letter addressed to Wilberforce uh, would urge him to go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery shall vanish away before it. This shift was quickly registered by African American and Afro British writers. Phyllis Wheatley and Richard Allen, David George and Boston King, Alad Equiano and Otto Bakugoano were part of a black evangelical network that connected America, Britain, Africa, and the Caribbean. 
In their eyes, God was liberating Africans from the Egypt of slavery in order to fulfill the prophecy that Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. Wheatley was convinced that the divine light is chasing away the thick darkness which broods over the land of Africa and bringing in the glorious dispensation of civil and religious liberty. In Britain, Kugawano identified slavery as one of the sins of Babylon in Revelation 18. Again, this text recurring, the city doomed for apocalyptic destruction. Among white evangelicals, there was a new missionary expansionism. As several scholars have pointed out, millennial expectations provided an essential impetus for the rise of Anglo-American Protestant missions. The major promoters of evangelical missions in the 1790s, including the Wesleyan Thomas Cook, the Baptist William Carey, the Congregationalist David Bogue, and Anglicans like Melville Horne, Claudius Buchanan, and Charles Simeon, were all ardent millennialists. In the words of Horne, they believe that the latter ends of the world are fallen upon us, and we have many considerations to excite us. In Britain, Seymour Drescher has pointed out, the takeoff of British abolitionism coincided almost exactly with the revival of the British missionary movement. The establishment of evangelical missionary societies followed in the wake of popular agitation against the slave trade between 1788 and 1792. The Baptist Missionary Society was founded in 1792, the London Missionary Society in 1795, and what became the Church Missionary Society, the Anglican Society, in 1799. From this point on, as Duncan Rice notes, the two movements mutually reinforced one another. The new evangelical missionary societies were an immediatist in relation to the abolition of the slave trade, while observing a tactful silence on the eradication of slave plantations, on which they sought to set up mission stations. Nevertheless, their leading lights had all been swept up in the popular enthusiasm for abolition that followed the establishment of the Abolition Society in 1787. The inquiry of the Baptist William Carey suggested that the campaign against the slave trade and the foundation of the Sierra Leone colony were signs of the latter days predicted by the Hebrew prophets. Evidence of the blessings of Christianity, commerce and civilization would prevail in Africa. The foremost Wesleyan missionary, Thomas Cook, had been a fierce critic of American slavery and he believed that the uh, abolition of the slave trade would facilitate the fulfillment of the Ethiopian prophecy. Carey and Cook were not alone in framing the campaign against the slave trade in millennial terms. In a celebrated sermon on the slave trade, the Unitarian Joseph Priestley expressed confidence that the great governor of the world is gradually bringing on a state of universal peace and happiness, which must imply the abolition of slavery as well as every other evil. Abolitionism was coming to be seen as an integral part of the church's missionary enterprise. By 1816, Thomas Chalmers, the, the Scottish uh, Church of Scotland leader, could write that the missionary movement was a branch of that very principle that abolished the slave trade of Africa. So what of the Anglican uh, layman who became the public face of British abolitionism uh, from the 1780s to the 1830s? On your left, uh, Granville Sharp in the centre, a young Thomas Clarkson and uh, William Wilberforce, uh, as well as Thomas Fowle Buxton. Well, these figures shared millennialist hopes. Sharp stands out from the others as a hot millennialist. Uh, it's fair to say, I think, that the patriarch of British anti-slavery was obsessed with biblical prophecy. His speculation on Daniel and Revelation reached fever pitch after the outbreak of the French Revolution. Unlike many English dissenters, he did not welcome the revolution, declaring that France was doubtless one of the ten horns of the beast. The fullest statement of his apocalyptic reflections came in two works published in 1805, though written some years earlier. The first was a treatise in defence of the traditional Protestant interpretation of da uh, Revelation 17 to 18, that the whore of Babylon was the Church of Rome. Sharp was convinced that even the French Revolution was a popish conspiracy. Robespierre and Danton were papists in disguise, killing the real friends of liberty. However, the events in France were the prelude to the apocalyptic showdown between Christ and Antichrist. The martyrs raised at the first resurrection in Revelation 20, would vanquish papal Babylon, the last tyranny, bringing the millennial kingdom when all war would cease and mankind would even forget the science of war and tactics. 
In a shorter tract printed in the same year, Sharp connected his apocalypticism to his abolitionism. Serious reflections on the slave trade and slavery began by citing Daniel chapter 2, where the fifth monarchy of God destroyed all opposing powers and went on to fill the whole earth. It then directed readers to Revelation 20, the key text on the millennium, together with three psalms which predicted that God would destroy the destroyers of the earth and establish his glorious kingdom on earth. In its final pages, the tract warned that the apocalyptic destruction of the bestial administration was imminent. The seventh trumpet and the seventh vial announcing the fall of Babylon and the reign of Christ were now nearly approaching. Liberty would be proclaimed to the captives and nations would beat their swords into plowshares, neither shall they learn war any more. So a blend of biblical prophecies from Daniel, Revelation, the Psalms, and Isaiah. To more secular minds, such apocalyptic talk was disconcerting. When Sharp broached the subject of the beast with Charles James Fox, the Whig leader, the Whig politician was baffled and is said to have asked, where is this beast? Yet the very extremity of Sharp's apocalypticism helps to explain the distinctively militant character of his abolitionism. Having concluded that slavery, as well as the slave trade, were the work of the beast, he had no room for compromise. Unlike Clarkson and Wilberforce, he was unhappy with the decision of the abolition society, of which he was chairman, to concentrate on the slave trade and postpone the attack on slavery to a later date. Wilberforce, the MP, is much more pragmatic in thinking about what will actually work in terms of uh, the policy that you can sell to the legislature. By contrast to Sharp, the post-millennialism of Thomas Clarkson was more muted. On concern with prophetic speculation, he nevertheless had a quiet conviction that the reign of God would spread over the earth. While remaining an Anglican, Clarkson renounced clerical orders and developed firm Quaker sympathies. Both his anthropology and eschatology had an element of perfectionism that was at odds with the strain of Augustinian realism of the Wilberforce Circle. Clarkson looked forward to a restored golden age. Together with his brother John, Thomas was one of the founders of the Peace Society in 1816. And like other Christian pacifists, they cherished Isaiah's prophecy that one day nations would beat their swords into plowshares. John Clarkson, in fact, took Wilberforce to task after a Bible Society meeting in 1820, when the latter expressed doubts about the ceasing of war upon earth. For the Clarkson brothers, pacifism, like abolitionism, was a means of ushering in the reign of virtue and happiness upon earth. Visions of the millennium were also present in the work of Wilberforce's favourite poet, William Cooper. In the task in 1785, he anticipated the fulfilment of Isaiah's prophecies, the lamb lying down with the lamb, uh, sorry, the, the uh, wolf lying down with the lamb, and the nations flocking to Zion. Thus heavenward all things tend, for all were once perfect, and all must at length be restored. While Wilberforce's Clapham sect distanced itself from sensationalist and utopian eschatologies and from the kind of speculation that Sharp indulged in, it did not reject the sober post-millennialism of Protestant divines, the kind forcefully articulated by their favourite biblical expositors, Philip Doddridge, Thomas Scott and Charles Simeon. Wilberforce's conversion followed his reading of Doddridge. He often listened to Scott's sermons at the Lock Chapel in London, while Simeon was another clerical mentor. All three were historicist post-millennialists in the tradition of Whitby, Lowman and Edwards. Scott rejected the strange, wild notions and extravagant practices grafted onto the belief of a millennium, but he had no doubt that a thousand years will follow the final destruction of all the anti-Christian powers. Writing of the millennium in the early 1790s, he declared that the dawn of this glorious day cannot be very distant. Wilberforce himself owned and annotated copies of Doddridge's family expositor and Scott's Holy Bible, and they indicate his belief that ancient prophecy was being fulfilled in the present age. Scott had argued that Isaiah's prediction of the wilderness blooming would be more and more accomplished, and the progress of the gospel will be with accelerated motion. Besides this, Wilberforce wrote, Africa, now, 1823. On more than one occasion, he wrote Restoration of the Jews or Jews' Restoration alongside Old Testament prophecies. <coughs> and he and his circle were firm supporters of the London Society for promoting the conversion of the Jews, an organisation steeped in prophecy belief. In 
in their family prayers, uh, subsequently published, uh, the Wilberforces petitioned the Lord for the conversion of the Jews, thine ancient people, and for the diffusion of the gospel throughout the earth. And they prayed for all who are suffering under the evils of slavery, asking that the reign of the Prince of Peace may be more established, that the knowledge of the Lord may cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Uh, Thomas Fowle Buxton carried on this Wilberforce tradition, eschewing enthusiasm while displaying confidence that the kingdom of God was conquering the world. And in addresses to missionary society, missionary conferences, uh, he waxed lyrical about the inexorable spread of the gospel. Now, this millennial hope would reach its apogee uh, during the drive for emancipation in the 1820s and 30s. Abolition in 1807 reinforced the confidence uh, in the universal triumph of justice and peace. The Sheffield journalist and poet James Montgomery celebrated the Parliamentary Act with a four-part part poem, The West Indies, in 1808. The final part located abolition within an eschatological narrative of missionary expansion, summarised in the argument, and I'll read this out to you. The Moravian Brethren, their missions in Greenland, North America and the West Indies, Christian Negroes, the advocates of the Negroes in England, Granville Sharp, Clarkson, Wilberforce, Pitt, Fox, the nation itself, the abolition of the slave trade, the future of the West Indies, of Africa, of the whole world, the millennium. So you get this sense here, this building kind of crescendo of history leading into the millennium and the abolition of the slave trade and the slavery itself being something that uh, prepares the way for it. According to mainstream post-millennialists, the millennium would be ushered in gradually by missions and societies, as well as by God's providential judgments on the nations. God works through means, insisted Simeon. Even the conversion of the Jews would be by human means, not by miracle. Simeon repeatedly stressed that through prayer and activism, Christians could hasten the millennium and accelerate the arrival of that glorious day. To the premillennialist, the Scot Edward Irving, the fiercest internal critic of optimistic evangelical enterprises, this was sheer delusion. The world was becoming more godless and would only be redeemed by the personal return of Christ. Yet he knew that postmillennialism was the reigning orthodoxy. He calls it that error under which almost the whole church is lying, that the present world is to be converted onto the Lord and so slide by a natural inclination into the church. The present reign of Satan hasten of his own accord into the millennial reign of Christ. In Irving's eyes then, the missionary optimism and the moral perfectionism of the evangelical world was at odds with the Protestant reformers' Augustinian pessimism about human nature and historical progress. <clears throat> but the dominant post-millennialism certainly extended the horizon of the possible. As Daniel Walker Howe has written in relation to the United States, 19th century reformers, their faith strengthened by the expectation that they worked to hasten the millennium and the second advent of Christ, were far more hopeful than reformers in our own chastened world. And by the 1820s, many British evangelicals felt a powerful sense of momentum. Simeon observed um, that various signs pointed to the near approach of the millennium. The light of the gospel was shining with a splendor unknown to former ages. And in the prophet Isaiah, he found hints that the isles of Western Europe should take the lead in this glorious work. It had always been a problem to find Britain in the Bible, but of course references to the isles of the sea and the ships of Tarshish were seized upon as a sign that Britain's prophetic, America's prophetic role had actually been predicted uh, in the Old and New Testaments. And in 1822 speech to Parliament on slavery in the Cape Colony, Wilberforce reminded MPs of the nation's historic mission we are engaged in diffusing the light of divine truth throughout the earth by our Bible societies and by our missionaries, whom we send to enlighten and civilize. And as he gazed into the millennium future, Wilberforce could foresee a time when the vast deserts of Africa shall have become the seat of civilization and true religion. Yet the powerful sense of missionary momentum is not sufficient to explain the rise of immediatism in the 1820s, when people started to call for the immediate emancipation of the slaves rather than a gradual process that might extend over decades. Successful missions among the enslaved might have reinforced complacent gradualism, as was in fact the case in the Danish Caribbean, 
where Moravian missions were unimpeded and highly successful. It was the thwarting of British missionary ambition that provoked a sudden sense of urgency about colonial slavery. The story of British immediatism is in part the story of what happened when the irresistible force of the missionary movement encountered the immovable object of plantation slavery. <coughs> Most planters were far from enthusiastic about missions, fearing that missionaries were a subversive influence on the enslaved. And as a consequence, evangelicals were increasingly inclined to the view that slavery, not merely the slave trade, was a roadblock to evangelization and hence to the millennium. At the annual meeting of the African Institution in 1817, James Stephen, who's Wilberforce's right-hand man, really, and, and has been called the true mastermind of the kind of British uh, abolitionist campaign, argued that the institution was committed to removing obstructions to the propagation of Christianity, among them the anti-Christian tyranny in the West Indies. So on this account, um, the labours of abolitionists would clear the way for the work of missionaries. Caribbean slave uh, insurrections uh, increased the sense of urgency. Uh, in 1823, the Demerara Rebellion, which arose from a missionary chapel uh, in Guyana, um, in British Guiana, uh, became a cause celebre back in Britain when the missionary was put on trial for inciting the Negroes to rebellion when he died in prison and was treated as a martyr. Uh, and this stimulated calls for immediate emancipation. But in the 1820s still, the leading evangelical missionary societies were still keen to pl calm planter nerves, enforcing a strict no-politics rule for their missionaries. They sought conversion of the slaves and the amelioration of their condition, rather than agitating for immediate emancipation. All of that changed with the Christmas Rebellion in Jamaica, which broke out at the end of 1831. Initial reports of another slave rising played into the hands of the West Indian lobby. But the public narrative shifted dramatically as it emerged that the planters were scapegoating missionaries once again for a rising that once again had been initiated from a missionary congregation by a native Baptist preacher, Sam Sharp. Hundreds of slaves have been killed in reprisals, missionaries put on trial, and missionary chapels burned to the ground. The Baptist missionary, William Nibb, returned to Britain with stories of atrocities and the planters' implacable opposition to the spread of the gospel. He quickly became a celebrity following his persecution in the so-called Baptist War, and he assured the British public that the final battle between slavery and Christianity was underway. In a public debate in 1832, Nib announced that the fiat of destruction against oppression has gone forth. Slavery has heard the award of her doom. The trumpet of jubilee shall sound. Africa shall arise. Anarchy and confusion shall be banished from the earth. And this message resonated powerfully, especially with evangelical dissenters, Baptists and Methodists, who engaged in a huge petitioning campaign. <coughs> it's thought that something like 90% of Methodists <coughs> signed anti-slavery petitions, uh, almost a fifth of the total signatories. In 1832, Joseph Ivamy published a lecture designed to demonstrate that the utter dis extinction of slavery was an object of scripture prophecy. Ivamy personified the connection between missions and abolitionism. As well as being the secretary of the Baptist Missionary Society, he sat on the committee of the Anti-Slavery Society and delivered his lecture on behalf of the more radical agency committee. And once again, we find him using these texts that have come up repeatedly. Uh, Revelation 18, prophecies about a universal uh, jubilee and so on. The total abolition of slavery, he believed, was prophesied in scripture. And in the final year of his life, Wilberforce confirmed his own post-millennial optimism. While there was much in the state of the world and the church which I deplore, he wrote, yet I am not among the croakers. I think real religion is spreading, and I'm persuaded it will increasingly spread till the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Slavery Abolition Act was thus celebrated as a jubilee, uh, an act of divine deliverance, as in this commemorative medallion. And you can see, perhaps underneath, I mean, that the text uh, over the liberated African is, this is the Lord's doing, uh, hailing it as a providential work. Uh, and then at the bottom of the, uh, the medallion, uh, it says, Jubilee, August 1st, 1834. 
So it's uh, invoking uh, the book of Leviticus, the idea of uh, the freeing of slaves in the year of Jubilee, and the idea of Jubilee as an eschatological happening, something happening at the end of history. And what we can see in the kind of wake of uh, British emancipation in the 1830s is a great campaign to globalise um, the anti-slavery movement. Um, and again, this is shot through with eschatological expectation. So to, so to take just one example, George Thompson, uh, sent out by the, uh, the Glasgow Anti-Slavery Society, uh, probably one of the most electrifying of abolitionist orators in the 19th century, very close friend of William Lloyd Garrison. Um, when he went on a, embarked on an anti-slavery mission to the United States in the 1830s, he predicted a moral earthquake that shall shake every system of oppression and regenerate the atmosphere of the world. The Ethiopian shall come forth. William Lloyd Garrison, his close friend, uh, signed some of his letters, years for the Jubilee. Uh, and again, his writing is kind of shot through with this Protestant millennialist expectation. So to conclude, Protestant optimism about the future direction of history was a powerful antidote to traditional Augustinian pessimism. It is no coincidence that the great era of missionary expansion and post-millennial eschatology was also the age in which many Protestants came to believe that they could change the world, that slavery could be eradicated across the face of the globe. Postmillennialism was not tied to abolitionism by an inexorable logic. Understanding how the link was forged requires close attention to the course of events, including the American and French revolutions, the founding of missionary societies, the success of abolition in 1807, slave risings in the Caribbean, and the political reforms of 1828 to 32. Nevertheless, missionary millennialism reinforced abolitionist momentum and eventually put it on a collision course with plantation slavery resulting in the rise of immediatism and the globalization of the anti-slavery cause. While post-millennialism was clearly not a sufficient factor in the rise of anti-slavery, it may have been a necessary one. Without the conviction that history was on their side, abolitionists would have found it harder to imagine a world without slavery. Thank you. for John. One over here, Justin. <coughs> Thank you so much. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, I just wondered, with the um, African-American, Afro-British writers, mm. um, did they share the same post um, millenarian sort of uh, outlook? Or um, was there some difference uh, amongst them? I, I wonder if their own experiences meant that immediacy was going to be more on their mind. Because um, Kukuanu's um, writing mm. seems to be much more intensely apocalyptic uh, in its yeah. focus. Um, so I wonder if you had anything to say about them, because obviously they're a, uh, an important but somewhat different category of abolitionist. Yeah, absolutely. I guess one thing I'd say is that they are... We, one can think in terms of different groups of abolitionists, but there's also a great deal of individuality. So e even among these, um, uh, the first generation of black writers in English, you know, who, who are publishing works, nearly all sponsored actually by Methodists, mainly Calvinistic Methodists, but some by the Wesleyan Methodists. Um, you know, they, they, there's quite a lot of variation among them. So the very early writers in the 1760s, uh, seem to acquiesce with the system of slavery. From the 1770s on, the time of the American Revolution, there's a new kind of politicization. Uh, but even among those figures, Kuguano stands out for you know, the ferocity of his critique, not just of the slave trade, but of slavery itself. Um, and it's worth emphasizing, as, uh, because sometimes people conflate the two, that the, the initial focus on the abolition of the slave trade does not necessarily imply immediate emancipation of the slaves. That is something that evolves over the decades following 1807. Whereas Kukuano in um, was it 17, 89, 90, around about that time, is quite emphatic that slavery has to go, that it's as much an abomination as the Atlantic slave trade. 
Uh, and as you say, the apocalyptic element in his writing is very, very strong. Um, I don't think there's a really big contrast between him and Granville Sharp. So, and, and he, Granville Sharp might well have mentored and be, been close to those figures. So one, one w wonders what the relationship was, whether they ever discussed biblical prophecy, but that's a possibility, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. I thought that was a really important contribution, um, re uh, restoring something that we really needed to debate. You also made me think of something else, which I think you're, the, given your areas of expertise, probably the perfect person to, to answer. Um, and that was the linkage between um, movements towards, well, anti-slavery, both abolition and ownership, with what we might today call the rise of religious toleration. You mentioned in your talk, obviously, the contribution of Baptists, Mm. Moravians, Methodists, Quakers naturally, and one could also add Swedenborgians. And I'm wondering, one consequence <laughs> of religious toleration was obviously the rise of nonconformity, but it also presumably gave us space to debate millenarian ideas that w wasn't being shut down in a, in a way that they had been done previously. And also in an enlightenment context, so how much... <laughs> That's not me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> How much is the impetus towards abolition also linked with what one would today call the rise of religious toleration? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, marginal dissenting groups in Britain play a very important role uh, in abolitionism. Quakers are the most important <coughs> in terms of the, the origin of the British abolitionist movement. Methodists and uh, Baptists play a big role in the, f in the final uh, phase in, in the 1830s. Um, and those groups do interpret um, the rise of toleration and the rise of anti-slavery as, as two, two signs um, of the, the coming millennium. So William, William Carey and his in, inquiry will link together the rise of Protestant missions, colonisation like the Sierra Leone colony, a free colony, the rise of civil and religious liberty, uh, and the rise of anti-slavery as all kind of signs that we're, we're ending the, that humanity is progressing towards the millennium. So they do link those up. And I think in 1828 to 32, one of the noticeable things is that quite a lot of evangelical Anglican clergy who'd been very keen supporters of the abolition of the slave trade in 1807 sit on the sidelines in 1832-33, uh, not least because they, they are becoming more pessimistic about the direction of travel, you know, the way in which uh, dissenters are rising, the, the, church, you know, the repeal of the Test and Corporation Acts, Catholic Emancipation, the Great Reform Act, they, they're often rather disillusioned about this and, and the whole progressive narrative is looking less plausible to them, and that's one reason why it's actually among Anglicans that you get the beginning of this more pessimistic premillennialist eschatology developing. Whereas it is among dissenters that that, that sense of buoyancy, that history is moving in the right direction, uh, is much stronger. Uh, and that is, is maybe one reason why they are such keen supporters of, of emancipation. So I think there is an interesting connection there between between dissent and uh, millennialist expectations. But yeah, that needs, the denominational dynamics, if you like, are one really interesting element of this whole story and they kind of need ex exploring a bit further. But. Okay. I'd just like to draw to your attention the following quick three points or half points. Firstly, St. Augustine, argued there was ni nothing either right or wrong it just depended whether it was in the right place secondly right i have traced it back to biblical times the jews did have slaves but they didn't have slaves like roman slaves or egyptian slaves or greek slaves they had people who had sold themselves to the Jews for a price. 
from whence of course we get the first contracts. In the Middle Ages it was called bloodletting, right? And every 13 years you had to let the slaves go through. And it is now caused, called Halloween commemoratively. Right, that's the second, that's the final point. And third point I would like to draw to your attention is the Washingtonians, founded back in the Victorian era. And, and these were people who, who, who um, formed themselves uh, into, um, into, into a group of society in America, US of A, uh, to deal with drink, right? And uh, they used to preach from the top of beer cars, out of which came the Oxford Group, a temperance, temperance society, and out of the Oxford Group came Alcoholics and Anonymous, which I'm sure you will at least note everybody has heard of, right? Um, now, uh, probably one of where I'm leading here, I, I mean, what would be your views on these things? That the, these seem to be building blocks leading up to building blocks. Uh, I mean, what would you be your views on Alcoholics Anonymous? If you look it up on the computer, it'll come up as a quasi-religion, right? I'm not quite sure I know what the word quasi means, even, but I think what he means is, is uh, a new religion. What were your views on those? Uh, exactly okay. for the time being. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I, I can't say much about the Washingtonians, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, I think Augustine is important to the story, as, a, as I've tried to uh, explore. Um, Partly because he's the dominant kind of theologian who, who uh, Protestants as well as Catholics kind of engage with, wrestle with, um, and all sorts of different elements in Augustine. Um, but I, th I, I think the reversal of uh, Augustine's uh, view on the millennium is, is quite important to the story. And of course, the way you deal with Old Testament slavery is, is also a major issue that um, abolitionists in both Britain and America really wrestle with and there's a great deal of kind of discussion of that throughout the um, throughout the period. Thanks very much John, I'm fascinated by that. I, 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 I'm particularly interested in the issue of um, the relationship between uh, human agency and, the, and mm. the coming of the millennium. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, what I was thinking of all the time is that uh, um, my view of Paul is that that's exactly what he was doing. That's, he, he, his position was very similar uh, to the, the people that you're talking about. Now, I know that the Pauline texts are deeply problematic in terms of uh, uh, an understanding of the uh, abolition of slavery, but uh, uh, to what extent do the people that you've looked at actually look at Paul as somebody who went actively out there to actually bring the nations in? The, the equivalent of the Ethiopians right, into, right. into the uh, imminent millennia which he thought was coming to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, the way that Granville Sharp deals with the problem of Old Testament slavery, if you like, is to say that um, the prohibition on perpetual slavery among uh, owning the owning of fellow Hebrews is now universalised in the kind of Christian era. So because, and he, here he cites Galatians, because in Christ there is no male male or female, because there is no Jew nor Gentile, what the Old Testament says about the, the prohibition on enslaving your fellow Hebrew perpetually now applies to all of, all of mankind, so there's this kind of universal... So, so that. Quotes, yeah, that's right, right. That's, that's how he kind of addresses the problem, you know, the, the, these kind of... Um, proof. So, so the, 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 that perpetual enslaving of Canaanites or the heathen can no longer be used because the, the Hebrew principle, the Jubilee principle, has now been kind of universalized in the Christian era. So with, with Sharp, there's a direct engagement with Paul. I mean, Sharp is probably the most interested in the Greek New Testament and you know, technical elements of biblical scholarship. Um, and Wilberforce reads Greek and kind of does read some kind of scholarly literature and, and Wilberforce's Bibles are also annotated. There are two or three of them survived. There never been there's never been any work on them at all. And that's actually quite quite interesting to kind of follow through. Sometimes it's just passages he's underlined. 
At other times he's written marginal comments um, and so that's something I'd like to do, I should do more study of that because it's, ne it's never really been worked on. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, it, the bell tolls, that, that, <laughs> that, that means lunchtime. Um, everybody is welcome to join us for lunch, uh, sandwiches next door in the, in the marquee right here. So please join us for lunch and then we'll reconvene in one hour at one o'clock. Thank you ever so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.